coordinate most of those events outside of that center. That center has kind of an oversight uh, responsibility for a lot of the events. The coordination is done on the scene. Mm -hmm. So they practice doing that. Uh, and Ray, I mean, basis. obviously the problem here is not only do, do police officers and law enforcement and rescue people have to respond to what's happened at the World Trade Center, but, but also a large number have to fan out to make sure that nothing occurs at other landmark buildings throughout the city. That's true, and of course services have to be provided throughout the city. The normal police and fire services, the rest of the city, 320 square miles, have to be covered. Uh, by emergency services, so it is indeed a tremendous challenge. Ray, you've been in the uh, in the middle of these kinds of episodes when you were the police commissioner in '93 during the attack. Your whole life has been dedicated to law enforcement and national security matters, but aren't you stunned by the magnitude of this attack and the complete surprise of it all? Yes, and the complexity of it. I think we've relied for years on the relative lack of sophistication on the part of. Uh, terrorist organizations. We've been very lucky, no question about it. Uh, we've had fairly good intelligence information, but uh, then again, uh, we knew nothing about the World Trade Center bombing before it happened. We had uh, terrorists cross into uh, our, our borders just before the millennium, uh, December 14th of 1999. Uh, you know, you, you just, uh, you can't predict these things. I am surprised, again, at the level of coordination and sophistication of of these uh, attacks. Ray, what, what, kind of, what kind of game plan is in place? Obviously, following the bombing of the World Trade Center, officials really uh, sat up and took notice and knew that this kind of attack, and per perhaps not of this magnitude, but another terrorist attack was possible. So what kind of game plan was put in place? Well, there's tremendous reliance on intelligence gathering. Certainly the FBI and CIA work more closely now than ever in, um, in communicating uh, with each other and gathering information with, with the NSA. The FBI has set up uh, counterterrorism task forces throughout the country. There's now, I believe, 23 of them. New York City was the first. And indeed, that was the entity that did the investigation of the World Trade Center bombing in 1993. Uh, There's a lot more awareness now than there was in 1993, quite frankly, but obviously uh, didn't prevent a terrible tragedy like this. All right. Well, Ray Kelly, former uh, New York Police Commissioner. Mr. Kelly, thanks very much for talking with us this morning. We're going to go now to Washington, to Campbell Brown, who is across the street from the White House, which, as we mentioned, has been evacuated. Campbell, what's the latest? Well, Katie, we're not actually sure at the moment if um, the where exactly the president is right now. He was in Florida this morning. We are understand that he was told uh, about the situation while he was in a holding room at the Booker Elementary School where he was scheduled to do a reading event. He was talked uh, or was informed by his national security advisor Condoleezza Rice by telephone while he was in that holding room of the first incident when the first plane crashed into the World Trade Center. He was actually reading to children when he heard about the second incident, and that was from Andy Card, his chief of staff, who uh, whispered in the president's ear while he was reading to children. Uh, he, we are told by White House officials that um, he is planning to uh, convene a, a, secure, a national security meeting of all of his top advisors. We do know that National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice and other key officials are now meeting in the Situation Room at the White House, as we mentioned. The rest of the White House has been evacuated. Only key uh, personnel are allowed there. That meeting began about 9.39, we're told, this morning. Um, everyone else again evacuated. One of the questions, Katie, that, that we're asking right now, given that no one's been informed where the president is, uh, and this is, of course, deliberate, is whether or not the White House will decide to put him on the so-called doomsday plane. This is a special plane designed uh, for the president in the event of a nuclear attack, and it's far more sophisticated than Air Force One. It has the absolute most advanced electronics uh, equipment on board. He's able to com communicate with anyone at any time and able to command the armed forces from this plane. It's able, they're able to refuel it mid-air, and they could essentially keep the president on this plane for an extended period of time. We don't know if that's an option that has been considered or something that they are, are looking at trying to do right now or whether or not his plan is to come back here to the White House. The situation where we are now, though, uh, it's fairly desolate because of the evacuation. They've actually pushed the White House staff, evacuated many of the buildings around here, and kept people several blocks away. 
Uh, we're at a hotel just about a block away where we do have a view, but again, only key personnel allowed in the White House at this time. Katie? All right, Campbell Brown. Campbell, thank you very much for that update, and please keep us posted as uh, things develop there. Katie, joining us on the phone now is the governor of the state of New York, George Pataki. Governor, good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, I just obviously, we're looking at some just devastating pictures of lower Manhattan, similar pictures at the Pentagon in Washington, and another incident in Pittsburgh. Just first of all, your reaction. Well, it's just a horrible, horrible day. It's an attack upon America, an attack upon New York, and uh, we have to respond uh, longer term to make sure we protect ourselves. But right now, we have to deal with this crisis and try to help the people who are still trapped, still at risk. And uh, we've mobilized our National Guard and statewide fire and uh, emergency services teams, and we're communicating and working with the city. And everything we can do to try to provide support is being done. After the 1993 attack on the World Trade Center, I mean, was there a sense that some of the vulnerability had been eliminated through security measures? I mean, obviously no one can predict an airliner or two airliners crashing into these buildings, but was there some sense that, that security had been shored up? You know, you do everything you can. You, you make sure that people don't get into the towers without being inspected. You make sure that people can't park under the towers, uh, but you just can't be prepared for a plane to fly into one of the towers or two planes to fly into the towers. It's a horrible, horrible situation. Uh, our heart goes out to all those whose families are uh, at risk, and we're just going to do everything we can to respond and be uh, supportive and helpful to uh, them. Obviously, the loss of life is the primary concern right now in helping those who've been injured, but uh, if you will, at least talk to me a little bit about the the other impact of, of this building this is for for example as Tom and, and Katie and I have pointed out the world financial financial center the hub of finances in the world if not at least here in the United States what type of of damage has has been done to the financial infrastructure of this country uh, the economic impact is something we can talk about as the days unfold right now we still have to focus on making sure we save as many people as possible help those who are injured help with an orderly removal of the people People who are leaving downtown and leaving the city, we're going to focus on that and be concerned about what may or may not be the economic consequences once the immediate crisis has passed. All right. Do you have plans to get down to this area? Yes, I'm in the city, and uh, I've been in touch with the mayor, and we're going to be continuing to do everything we can. Governor, what about uh, other emergency procedures for the city of New York uh, in the next several days in terms of what's going to remain shut down and so on? A lot of people have this as a destination. A lot of people, millions well, Tom, of people have here. Uh, Tom, right now we do have limited service out of the city. We have both the Metro North and Long Island Railroad running out. We have the George Washington Bridge open. Uh, the tunnels are shut for security reasons. We're not having traffic other than emergency traffic come into the city. Uh, and I think at this point it would be extremely unlikely that we're going to have many people coming into the city tomorrow. We're going to be continuing to try to deal with the horrendous situation downtown. All Thank right. you very much, Governor. I know it's been a long and difficult day, and it will go on uh, for you and for all New Yorkers for a long, long time, unfortunately. Well, our prayers are with the, the families and the people whose lives are still at risk. Thanks, Thank you Governor. very much, Governor. Thank you. We want to go now, Matt, to uh, Jim Mikloszewski, who is at the Pentagon. Jim, a lot of these flights were transcontinental flights, uh, heavily loaded not only with passengers but with fuel. Uh, that's right, Tom, and uh, we just learned a few m moments ago that uh, the U.S. Navy is dispatching a couple of aircraft carriers from Norfolk, uh, the JFK and the George Washington. Uh, one will be stationed off of New York. Uh, the other will be stationed in the Atlantic as close to Washington, D.C. as they can get. Uh, they'll be there to provide any possible military support that may be needed, including flying any kind of air cover uh, should there be any additional warnings of any further terrorist attempted attacks. Uh, now, as we stood here this morning, you can see the smoke is still billowing. The smoke just in the past few minutes has changed from black to white, a strong indication that they're throwing more water on the fire, as we saw from other uh, vantage points. Uh, but the priority now is to get the fire under control. Uh, a casualty count is impossible at this point, Tom. As you've seen from the earlier pictures, the plane opened a huge wide gash in the side of the building. Uh, we're being told between the fourth and the fifth corridors. It, it smashed through the E and D rings, and people who were in that area tell me that debris and parts of the plane actually penetrated deep all the way into the B ring. There are five rings, A through E, and it entered in the E ring, so it plowed through a number of the rings. 
Uh, the priority now, as I said, is, is accounting for uh, the casualties. Uh, medevac helicopters have been flying in and out. You hear the ambulances. Occasionally, we've even seen F-16s flying low uh, routes around the Pentagon and over Washington, D.C., flying those CAPS or, or uh, air patrol missions uh, uh, that are usually flown in combat. But to see two aircraft carriers moved in locations off the United States to provide air cover, Tom, uh, I mean, that's the kind of thing you normally see in a war zone. Uh, Mick, uh, can you tell me, uh, was that a chosen randomly where they hit uh, the Pentagon? Can you tell us what the, what the function of those people in that particular ring was, where, they were, where it was hit? Well, it's interesting because uh, uh, a number of people, uh, and it, this really wasn't sarcastic, but they said, well, they hit on the wrong side because just the opposite side of the building, of course, you have uh, the offices of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and, uh, and the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld. We were on that side of the building when the plane hit. Uh, we felt the building shake, the, the windows rattle, and looking outside, immediately saw people on the run. There was pandemonium in the hallways. Now, that section uh, of the Pentagon, uh, I thought at first, uh, when it was described to me, uh, that it may have hit in an area where some of the special operations offices are located. Uh, uh, the assistant secretary for special operations is located near there, but the plane actually hit maybe about uh, 60 to 70 feet to the right of that location. In that part of the building, there's uh, uh, it's very near a mall area, actually, where they have uh, a shopping area uh, for Pentagon employees. After all, there are 25 to 30,000 employees in there on any given day. Uh, and also in that part of the building, you had many Navy personnel, many reserve personnel. Uh, I bumped into many Army personnel who are adjacent to that. Uh, they think everybody's all right. The Navy people I talked to said they still had a few people that were unaccounted for. But again, it's going to be impossible to tell exactly what the casualty count is in there until they get that fire under control. Matt. All right. Jim Mikoshetsky outside the Pentagon. He would know a lot about uh, what the U.S. officials know. He would. And he said all he knew about was the two plane attacks in New York. Uh, the one at the Pentagon, and he said that they had heard something had happened in western Pennsylvania. That, of course, consistent with the reports we've had about a Pittsburgh airport. So, so we are, um, so we're, uh, the sense we have is that, uh, that if many officials, many senior people here in Washington may know less than we do, at least officially, about what has happened here. All right, Britt Hume, thanks. John McCain is, uh, is on Capitol Hill speaking, and we're, uh, we got an ear out for him as well. All right, Britt, thanks very much. Uh, uh, Newt Gingrich, the former Speaker that? of the House, was on the air with us not long ago and described this as the 21st century Pearl Harbor, and that does not overstate it. Uh, there may be as many as, on, on a typical day, there would be 50,000 people working in the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, and those towers are gone. How many of those people were able to evacuate, we do not know. Uh, once again, to Britt Hume in Washington. Britt? John. By the time rescue workers could get in there, the destruction was just terrific. So John, do you have any sense of the casualties? Uh, we don't have any sense, Peter, except the size of the medical operation that has been set up here is enormous. Uh, they are anticipating the casualties. Certainly the injured will be in the hundreds. Uh, I certainly don't want to speculate on those killed. And John, it, it, it's a little hard to get, to, to get a sense of the size sometimes for the picture. Can you describe maybe in feet or in yards how big, a, how big a penetration this is? The roof has collapsed, Peter. There is a chasm in the side of the Pentagon that is probably 200 or 300 feet across. Um, from the roof of the Pentagon, there is this huge V shape that has collapsed. You can see deep inside the Pentagon from the street now. This is into the inner courtyard of the Pentagon itself. It's into the innermost ring of the Pentagon, Peter. Uh, I have not been able to get into the courtyard, but I was told that the penetration was all the way into the deepest ring of the Pentagon. And John, it, it, the office building, the Pentagon is about, what, six stories high? It's uh, five stories mm -hmm. above ground, Peter, and several stories below. Uh, clearly, the damage uh, is primarily above ground, but also some of those in the lower offices. I was sitting in the Pentagon when the uh, attack happened. I was on the opposite side of the building. It shook the entire building. It was very clear that something terrible had happened. Uh, there was chaos immediately after the attack, Peter. 
Secretary of Defense. I walked out with the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Uh, the Marine Corps Commandant couldn't get out the door because security had locked it. Uh, it was chaos. Okay, John. And the fires are still, are still burning at the moment, we believe? They are still burning. They are mostly oil fires, it appears, Peter. Uh, the fire hoses have been on the, uh, the various fires for the last several hours, so they're beginning to put them out. But obviously, there is still heavy gray smoke coming out of that portion of the Pentagon that was so terribly damaged. And John, there are a couple of aircraft, at least, around the country today which are still unaccounted for. You gave a very clear description earlier of how... The Had you made it there yet when things started to unfold this morning? Well, actually, um, I do work at Two World Trade Center on the 87th floor. And I uh, actually woke up this morning and was tying my shoes and uh, saw on television that uh, the first building got hit. And uh, that's about the time I was about to walk out the door, so I kind of froze and uh, didn't really know what to do at that point. Just kind of kept watching the television. So you worked on the first building that was hit or the second uh, building the, that was hit? The second building that was hit. So uh, Right about where the plane went in, I, I believe. Mm. You have no idea, do you, what has happened to your colleagues at the office? Uh, that's correct. I actually, uh, when the first building collapsed, I saw it on TV, and I actually ran outside and started going down uh, uh, West Broadway here, and uh, I saw the second one go down, and uh, there was kind of a mass of people rushing up the street and actually uh, started running myself. <laughs> How far do you live from uh, uh, from the uh, financial district, Nick? How far do you live from the World Trade Center? Right now I'm on Street. Uh, where I actually live is about 15 blocks away. I'm maybe about five blocks right now. What's happening uh, around you? We can hear the sirens. Uh, You're within five blocks, that's awfully close. Yeah, I'm actually, I am pretty close right now. I'm just looking down where I used to work. It's all a cloud of smoke. I, I think there's a lot of police. Uh... It's a domestic Pearl Harbor. In, in many ways, it's worse than Pearl Harbor. I think we will probably find the casualties are going to be higher than they were at Pearl Harbor. In Pearl Harbor, we knew immediately who had done it, and we therefore knew what the return address was. It was Japan. Here, we have higher casualties, less certainty as to where the attack came from, and therefore a, a more difficult response. But there must be a very strong military response to this act of war. Thank you very much, Ambassador Paul Bremer, who is a longtime colleague of Henry Kissinger and a veteran of national security affairs in this country. Uh, this is a uh, routine in times like this. The Taliban ambassador to Pakistan has condemned what he called a terrorist attack, saying this is a terrorist act. We strongly condemn as the Taliban have given shelter to the Saudi mil militant Osama bin Laden, of course, and he, he's been accused by the United States in the past of masterminding these kinds of attacks. So they're at least on the record uh, from a rhetorical point of view of saying we had nothing to do with this. Let's go to Martin Fletcher, NBC's Martin Fletcher, Tom, who is in Israel. Uh, right now, Martin. To be horrified, and uh, but what we have to do at this point is focus on uh, helping those who are at risk, helping those who have been injured, making sure there's an orderly removal from Lower Manhattan, and, and that is our focus at this point. Governor, have you, have you, are you in a position to go to the scene? Are you in a position to go to Lower Manhattan? Do you think you should? Would you like to, uh, or are you, are you locked down? No, I'm, a, I'm in the city, uh, but the important thing is to be able to stay in contact with the White House, with City Hall, with our statewide emergency services. We've gotten uh, offers of support from all the surrounding states with their emergency services, and uh, the critical thing right now is to be able to coordinate to make sure that the response is the strongest and the, the most compassionate it can be for the people whose lives are still at risk. And okay. We're mobilizing National Guard units from across the state. We're getting help from the surrounding states and coordinating with the city, and that's what, we're do that's what we have to do at this point. And Governor, what have you done? about the other so-called high-profile target potential targets in New York City like the UN and the bridges and things like uh, this are they all locked are they all evacuated uh, and locked down UN, now? UN's evacuated the tunnels have been closed the the, the uh, George Washington bridge is open under security for emergency services coming in and uh, people going out we've shut down most of the mass transit Grand Central is open under very tight security but people who pass through the security are uh, have limited service to the to the northern suburbs and we're doing the same thing on Long Island, but uh, the important thing now is to provide as much help as quickly and as effectively to those whose lives are at risk or those who've been injured, and we're working with the city and the federal officials to make sure that happens. Do you believe that New York City is now under control? 
New York City has been under attack, uh, and until we get through this, uh, we just have to continue to respond as, as strongly as we can. And are you in a in a in a profile now? Are you in a position where you actually think there's there's a potential for more? Uh, we just don't know. That's why we have to not only help those who have been injured, but also take every security step we can to try to prevent further incidents. We just don't know, Peter. Okay, Governor Pataki, thank you very much. Governor George Pataki of New York who is in New York City, um, which of course is where he probably belongs at a, at a moment like this. Downtown Manhattan is saying simply that the National Guard has been called in, the tunnels are closed, the George Washington Bridge, which is across, uh, which goes across the Hudson River um, from, uh, from the west side of Manhattan into New Jersey. Just remember a large segment of the, or large, many thousands of people from New Jersey work in New York and there's tremendous commerce back and forth on a daily basis. That has all been brought to a help. It's interesting to recall, John Miller, that the attack on the Trade Towers in 93 was launched from New Jersey, or at least the operational headquarters of the people who attacked the Trade Center were in New Jersey. Correct. Uh, and the, uh, the building of the bomb. Additional videotape now of what happened here in New York earlier this morning. Watch this. This is, I haven't seen this before. I'm seeing it for the first time as you do. The first building hit at high, at high floor by the first plane is in smoke. The second building has just been hit with a plane. The whole building's gone. I beg your pardon. As you, it was the collapse of the first tower. Now let's go back over. This videotape we've not seen before. The, the tower that was hit by the first plane is still standing. It won't be for long. Remember, this all happened this morning between 9 and 11 a.m. In the second building, now you saw, we'll show these videotapes to you in sequence. First, you have the videotape of the plane coming, and it was coming at pretty high speed, right. much greater speed than the first plane that hit. We have videotapes showing the building hit, and then this second videotape taken from some distance of the first of the towers to collapse. Perhaps we can re-rack that videotape at some point. Strange, eerie, I used the word, if it is a word, Dante asked earlier in the day, how instead of a ball of flame going up and great billows of smoke going upward, they came downward into and toward the earth itself. But that's because of building collapse. Now, this is the collapse, the first of the towers to collapse. We just secured this video. Building's gone. Indeed. Holy fucking Jesus! We do apologize for the language on the videotape. Um, now, one can understand uh, people seeing this incredible sight. And when you see this, you're reminded why everyone in authority is saying we should be prepared for eventually finding out many dead, many seriously wounded. And at this hour, as night has not yet fallen, but begins to creep in on New York City, there are people trapped in the rubble. And when the third building collapsed, World Trade Center building number seven. Uh, people uh, who are making efforts to save those people in the rubble who are trapped in there, some of those people uh, were in peril as that Trade Center building number seven collapsed within the last hour, hour and a half. Now what you're going to see next is videotape of the second World Trade Center building collapsing from a different view than you've seen it before. This is, again, new videotape. One of the World Trade Center buildings has already collapsed. The second, the actual first one to hit by the plane is still standing. It is a smoking ruin on its upper floors. These World Trade Center towers have absorbed a tremendous shock of fast-flying airliners. 
highly inflammable aviation fuel. The one building has collapsed. Oh no! Oh no! And once it starts to go, how quickly it went. These home videos taken from across the way from a place that once had a spectacular view of a spectacular New York skyline. And the smoke told the story. Scott Pelley will bring Americans. I asked the American people to join me in saying a thanks for all the folks who have been fighting hard to rescue our fellow citizens and to join me in saying a prayer for the victims and their families. The resolve of our great nation is being tested, but make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. God bless. President George W. Bush now on his way to Washington, D.C. He will address the nation a little bit later tonight, the time to be determined, but you will see it here live on the Fox News Channel. Linda, the uh, president talking about the victims, one of the victims we know by name, uh, Barbara Olson, who appeared on this network many times, uh, it is now being reported on the wires that she spoke to her husband, Theodore Olson, twice during the hijacking using her cell phone, and she told her husband that the hijackers were using knife-like instruments, um, and they further declined to describe the conversation. Barbara Olson killed today in the plane that crashed into the Pentagon. Joining me on the phone now, Colonel David Hackworth, uh, America's most decorated living soldier. Colonel Hackworth, uh, America wants, evidently wants to go to war about this. How do we do that? Well, you know, having lived through... Now, that's 1-800-435-7669. QVC acknowledges today's events and expresses our heartfelt concern with this national tragedy. For more information, please turn to your TV news channel. In light of these events, QVC will be temporarily suspending its broadcast. Our solidarity with the people in New York and America. First, we completely are appalled, shaken, but also resolute as a result of this awful action. This is Pearl Harbor, 21st century, and it, it's an unknown enemy, although they will be known, attacking civilians. First to the families of those who may have losses and so many, so many calls we received today from people who couldn't find loved ones, didn't know where they were, we feel your pain, I know, for an hour I couldn't find my daughter whose high school is in the shadow of the World Trade Center. And praise God, I was able to find her and she and my wife who works downtown in New York and my other daughter are safe. So our first feeling is for the families and the suffering and the pain that goes on in New York and throughout the country. I spoke on behalf of us to the president this afternoon. He wished me to convey to New Yorkers that he will do everything possible to help the rescue and the recovery and what needs to be done in future years and months because this loss is just a terrible loss that will not go away soon. We all, he also expressed the second point, which we share, and that is that those who did this must be brought to justice. For too, off, too long, the world has just shrugged its shoulders at terrorism. But we now know that none of us as Americans can avoid that terrorism unless we take strong action against it. 
And I express to the President on behalf of both of us and all of the Senate that we stand shoulder to shoulder with him in this fight, that no one will try to seek partisan or geographic or any other advantage. We will be united in this fight. And we will do everything we can. We cannot have a month-long or a year-long fight against terrorism. We have to have a permanent fight against terrorism, because this is the new form of warfare. And so the few things we ask people, first, for prayers. Second, anyone in America who can, through their local authorities, give blood. We are desperately short of blood. We need doctors who can contact the authorities if they live within a days of New York. We are short of doctors. And of course, FEMA and the urban rescue teams, as many as our nation has, are being sent immediately. Uh, America can never turn back from this point. And we are in a new era where we realize the world is an interconnected but sometimes very nasty place. We have to be prepared for it. And so, two things. One, love and caring for those who accepted loss and help for those who need some path to recovery and second resoluteness that we will never let this happen again and do everything we can and some of the steps won't be easy to make sure it doesn't happen again well chuck and i wish we could be in new york um, but that's not possible and we've been in constant communication with the authorities, uh, with the White House, the governor's office, the mayor's office, with the emergency officials. And I think that it's clear to everyone, this was an attack on America. It may have been directed uh, at New York, but it really is attack, attacking everything we stand for in every part of our country. And I'm very proud of the way New Yorkers responded. Uh, the behavior of the people um, on the ground, the emergency uh, resources, our police and, and firefighters have just been extraordinary. And many of them uh, were put in harm's way because they were doing their job. Our medical facilities, all the hospitals in the immediate area are overwhelmed. Uh, we are moving uh, non-critical patients out of uh, hospitals in the city, out to Long Island, even Westchester, in order to make room for uh, those who have been injured. Uh, we do need more blood. We need doctors and nurses and other medical uh, professionals who would be able to uh, support uh, those who are working uh, so tirelessly. Uh, we appreciate the federal resources, certainly the uh, search and rescue teams, the National Guard, uh, FEMA, uh, we've been assured we will have everything we need uh, to conduct the various phases of the reaction. First, of course, is to find any who might have survived. Second is to find every body of anyone who has not, to do the hard work of sifting for evidence, and then for the task of rebuilding. Uh, this will be a monumental undertaking. This was a nerve center of communications, of infrastructure that affects uh, not just our nation, but the entire world in terms of the access to and transfer of information. We're also deeply concerned about the attack on the Pentagon. Uh, we just had a conference call with our congressional, our Senate leadership, uh, bipartisan, uh, Senators Daschle and Reed and Lott and Nichols. Uh, we also heard from Senator Warner, he and Senator Levin are at the Pentagon where uh, they have gone to uh, um, do everything they can to support what needs to be done and they were certainly very confident that uh, you know our military forces are as alert and ready as they need to be. Uh, so there is 
uh, an enormous amount of very uh, good, solid work being done in New York, in Washington, throughout the country. Uh, I would just reiterate, there is absolutely no need for anyone anywhere to panic. Uh, this has been carried out in an orderly and effective manner, uh, but we have a lot of work ahead of us, and that work includes uh, the identifying uh, of those who are responsible for this cowardly and evil act and holding them accountable wherever they might be, however long it would take. Do you have any questions? idea who is responsible for these attacks? I think they do, and uh, they're not prepared to say yet, but uh, I have spoken to both FBI and CIA today, and they are certainly not clueless. We step away from Senators Schumer and Clinton to give you some new information. We you know, we had different views during the day, but this was photographed from that side of the building. Now we're going to recue that sequence of videotape. This includes new videotape material obtained by CBS News over the last hour, hour and a half. We have shown some of it. Now, this is the latest new video we have. You see the plane coming in high speed aiming for the mid level and hits it the heart of a city and a nation that was the second flight united flight 175 and this is a reverse side of the building see the plane actually pierced the building there were several angles virtually came out the other side and yet another view the plane hitting it's almost like the building swallowed the plane yeah. yes and here you see this aircraft below, did you see that? All right. You had to be looking closely in the right-hand side to see it hitting there. And indeed, Russ Mitchell said it is almost as if the building swallowed the plane and then belched back up. Well, nobody's ever seen photographs like that because nothing like this has ever happened before. We go to David Martin. Much of it has been evacuated throughout this day. There have been uh, rescue officials trying to get to the area where the buildings crumbled into the ground. Uh, the problem is the uh, emergency crews say that the situation has been just too dangerous for many hours throughout today to get anywhere near the, uh, the rubble to work on any possible rescue attempts. Well, let's go back to Calgary. I think we uh, now have uh, hooked up with uh, Will Engel, who is uh, the former American Airlines pilot who's been helping us through today. More information since we last uh, uh, talked, uh, uh, Mr. Engel, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are now from what you've heard throughout the day, what you think uh, uh, happened in those uh, final minutes on board those aircraft. Well, my heart goes out to the crew members' families because, uh, you know, they've experienced a horrendous loss. In Anybody who call it the Condit investigation know that they were used in, and et cetera. Come on, right. please. Uh, 100 doctors, 100 nurses are, are standing by uh, the main police facility that is now the command post for the NYM uh, Eastern Time. Um, we also put the flash up that um, U.S. intelligence sources have told uh, NBC News that it is apparently now, because of freshly developed information, 90% likely that Osama bin Laden, uh, the uh, exiled uh, and fugitive terrorist uh, based uh, most recently out of uh, Afghanistan, uh, is involved, if not uh, totally responsible for, uh, this coordinated attack. This is video of Osama bin Laden. He is 44 years old. He has no nationality because although he was born in Saudi Arabia, the Saudis uh, revoked his nationality from him. They took his passport away, uh, did not want to appear to support him in any way, shape, or form. He has, uh, as most recently, been, been in Afghanistan with the Taliban government. Let's get right to Bob Bazzani. He's got more information down from the New York Stock Exchange. Bob. The first hit the Trade Center at 8.50 a.m. The second, 18 minutes later, slams into the other tower. It's got to be a, a terrorist attack. I can't tell you anything more than that. I saw the plane hit the building. After the hijacked American and United Airlines planes hit the Trade Center, the twin 110-story towers collapsed. As many as 20,000 people had just arrived for work. Almost simultaneously, another hijacked American plane nosedives into the Pentagon. A fourth hijacked plane, another United flight, crashes in western Pennsylvania. Scores of government and corporate buildings across the United States are evacuated, including the White House, the Capitol, and other major centers of government. Airports are shut down. Terrorism experts say Osama bin Laden is the most likely suspect. The president doesn't name a suspect.
Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. The first military priority, though, appears to be defense. Navy ships are sent to stand guard near Washington and the damaged Pentagon and to protect New York as the nation reels from its worst terrorist attack. And there is late word at this hour that there have been a series of explosions in Afghanistan, the known hideout of terrorist Osama bin Laden. Whether or not the U.S. is responsible for those explosions or is any, in any way retaliating is not clear at this hour. In the meantime, military forces in and around the Washington area remain at their highest possible state of alert. That's the story from the Pentagon. I'm Beverly Kirk. Now to Terry Ruggles in New York started smoking and flaming this morning during the morning rush hour. It was a typical Tuesday rush hour, and then it happened. The terrorist attack began just before 9 this morning when a huge commercial airliner crashed into one of the towers of New York's World Trade Center. Part of the building exploded. A second airplane, a 727, just rammed into the building. Some thought it was a freak accident, but 18 minutes later, when a second commercial airliner crashed into the other tower and a huge fireball engulfed much of the building, onlookers knew this was no accident. This is a vicious, unprovoked, uh, horrible attack on innocent uh, men, women, and children. It's one of the most heinous acts, probably, certainly, in, in, in world history. Shortly before 10, one World Trade Center collapsed. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! 30 minutes later, the second building collapsed. Those on the street stared in disbelief. Two of New York City's icons were transformed into towers of smoke and fire and death. It was a war zone. It was just unbelievable. An undetermined number of people have died. Others are still trapped. What was a symbol of New York City is now a symbol of terrorism. So the two big towers and building number seven of that seven building World Trade Center complex were also told building number six is also in jeopardy and may go down this evening. Late this afternoon, the mayor called extra police down to that area to help look for survivors, and the National Guard has been called in to patrol the lower end of Manhattan. That's it from New York City. I'm Terry Buckles. Back to you. Four commercial planes were involved in these attacks, and here's a look at those flights. American Airlines Flight 77 departing Dulles Airport en route to Los Angeles. American Airlines 11 leaving Boston to Los Angeles. United Airlines Flight 175 departing from Boston to Los Angeles, and United Airlines Flight 93 from Newark to San Francisco. If you have concerns about a loved one being on a flight, here are the numbers that you can call. For American Airlines, call 1-800-245-0999. For United Airlines, 1-800-932-8555. Hundreds of Central New Yorkers were let off work early today. This afternoon, we caught up with customers at Babe's Macaroni Bar and Grill. Folks there could still watch the coverage as they ate. Do not go down the ground. You will get trapped. You will get trapped somewhere. Uh, big boom down the steps, everything fine, so we got to the basement and everything just fell in. Uh, I got trapped on there with another guy, crawled out, kept getting hit in the head, had bags all around, finally we clawed our way out over the rubble. Yeah. Come on, Tom. did all right. All right, way to be Tom. Even the bloodied felt incredibly lucky on this terrible day. And firefighters could embrace each other for a few moments before facing many more hours of trauma. As New York struggled to cope, to adapt to the clogging dust, the fallout of so much tragedy, more news was coming in. A fourth crashed airliner in Pittsburgh. And somehow, American government seemed almost powerless amidst all this. The centers of that power had been evacuated. Key congressional leaders taken to secret locations. The president himself whisked to a nuclear bunker in Nebraska shaken but pledging somehow to find those who masterminded this day of mayhem and massacre. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward Earth. and freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims 
of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. Hours after the attacks, the United States, the whole world, is struggling to take it all in. There's really no more rescue the farmer can seriously attempt. It's now a question of salvage amid the wreckage, as others in New York try to establish how many men, women, and children have been lost. A priest picks his way through the New York ruins. The World Trade Center has been reduced to the stumps of skyscrapers that once helped define one of the world's most vibrant cities, normally loud with life. An entire society feels itself violated by terror. James Robbins, BBC News. Now, reports are just coming in, unconfirmed reports uh, from Afghanistan, that Afghanistan's capital is under attack. That's uh, early on Wednesday morning. Uh, we'll bring you more information as soon as we get it. Of course, there is speculation that this could be retaliation by the Americans, but there's nothing firm yet. Of this type, uh, a sustained... Uh, I understand, Shep, how it would have been possible for air controllers and indeed even defense officials in Washington uh, watching a plane approach along a path toward that Pentagon to believe that it was really just heading for National Airport and at the last minute veered off course. So you get a sense of how vulnerable in terms of its geographic location the Pentagon is um, to the kind of attack that was made today by a large, a large aircraft. This day is the 11th of September, the year 2001. Some people have said the ninth month, the 11th day, 9-1-1, is a day that will be in bold print in future history books, a day that is a dark mark for this country, a day that everyone will remember where they were when they heard the news. After all, our largest city and most vital financial market immobilized, the country terrorized politically and psychologically. Dateline Stone Phillips and I takes us through this astonishing day, minute by minute. Today, the unimaginable happened. At the start of a busy workday, New Yorkers heard an explosion, then looked up to see a symbol of America's economic power one of the World Trade Center's twin towers billowing smoke and flames. Yeah, the glass just flamed, exploded out the front of the World Trade Center. Glass flew everywhere. Minutes later, literally from out of the blue, an even more horrifying sight. A jetliner bearing down on the other tower. It was a direct hit. An airplane, a 727, just rammed into the building. Before the hour was out, the symbol of American military power, the Pentagon, was also in flames. It, too, apparently the target of a new weapon, a passenger jet hijacked and turned into a guided missile. Across the country, shock, sorrow, fear, outrage, and the realization that America was under attack. About 8.45 this morning, the sky over Manhattan was clear following a night of violent thunderstorms. In the city's financial district, the very heart of American commerce, thousands of workers were already at their desks. Moments later, in the upper reaches of the 110-story North Tower, sudden impact. As Matt just mentioned, we have a breaking news story to tell you about. Apparently, a plane has just crashed into the World Trade Center here in New York City. One second after the sound started, there was gray smoke and what looked to be like confetti flying all over the place. Fire and death above, confusion below, as some 10,000 people screamed out of the building. It was a couple, of, a lady had a big gash on her head, so it was people stamping one, one over top of the other. Witnesses reported a horrifying scene, desperate people jumping from the burning skyscraper, bloody clothing and body parts scattered on the streets below. As emergency crews rushed to the southern tip of Manhattan, the immediate thought, could it really be happening again? Stop back, okay? Come on. In 1993, the same building was hit by a truck bomb, Islamic militants hoping to topple the one tower into the other. Six people died in that attack, and 1,500 were injured. But within the first minutes today, it was clear that the toll this time 
would be much higher. Then at 9.03, less than 20 minutes after the first strike, with police and rescue personnel still scrambling to respond, this. Many people in the building. Oh, another one just hit. Something else just hit. A very large plane just flew directly over my building, and there's been another collision. Can you see it? I can see it on the shot. Live cameras trained on the first stricken tower captured another huge explosion. This one on the south tower. Only this time, the attack was documented. This indelible image to be replayed again and again, seared into the American memory. And here it comes right there. An American Airlines 767 with 92 people on board hijacked on its flight from Boston to Los Angeles, becoming the implement of mass murder. The impact was devastating. The airliner punching through the skin of the huge tower. Another rain of glass, concrete, and terror. Just like this unbelievable ball of fire. And the whole street, which is now awakened, everyone's like, whoa. People start crying, people start running. It was now clear that this was no accident. The first tower had also been hit by a hijacked passenger jet, a United flight that had also taken off from Boston, bound for L.A. The attacks left New York virtually paralyzed. Tunnels and bridges linking the city shut down, subways closed, telephone lines jammed, cell phones overloaded as frantic callers tried to contact loved ones. At 9.30, President Bush in Florida to talk about education addressed a nation reeling and in need of reassurance. Uh, today we've had a national tragedy. Two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. But even as the president pledged to hunt down and punish those responsible, another attack, this one even more audacious, the target the Pentagon. Another American Airlines jet bound for Los Angeles had been hijacked, this one taking off from Washington's Dulles Airport. It was another direct hit. NBC's Pentagon correspondent Jim Miklaszewski suddenly found himself on the front lines of a war that had come home. I don't want to alarm anybody right now, but apparently there, it, it felt just a few moments ago like there was an explosion of some kind here at the Pentagon. 9.43 a.m. With concern that the White House could be a target, President Bush boarded Air Force One bound for a special secure command post at a military base. At 9.49, the Federal Aviation Administration announced it was shutting down the nation's air traffic. In a world turned upside down, hundreds of passenger planes crisscrossing the country were now potential terrorist weapons. The Federal Aviation Administration ordered all airports closed and all planes which were in the air were directed to land at the nearest airport. This morning, on a scale beyond belief, Americans experienced what it's like to feel truly vulnerable, to realize when someone is willing to die for a cause, we are all potential targets. The number one suspect, this man, Osama bin Laden, a radical Islamic terrorist linked to past attacks on American interests. A London-based Arab journalist said today that three weeks ago, Followers of bin Laden warned of a huge and unprecedented attack on the U.S. Was this it? Somebody provided the logistical support for this operation, and uh, clearly the only person or one of the, the, the only people that has built up such a network in the world today is Osama bin Laden. There was no word from bin Laden, but the Taliban-ruled government of Afghanistan, where bin Laden is based, issued a statement this morning condemning the attacks and saying bin Laden did not have the capability to carry out such acts. And there were plenty of other suspects, ranging from radical Palestinian groups to rogue governments. President Bush has committed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to identify and bring to swift justice those responsible for these despicable attacks. While the nation's intelligence community ran down possible suspects and tried to assess whether more attacks were imminent, rescue workers in New York and Washington confronted a disaster of immense proportions. In New York, local hospitals began filling up, urgent calls going out to every available surgeon and nurse, long lines of people outside waiting to donate blood. There's a war zone. Why do we it's go up the it's it's unbelievable. unbelievable. And still, there was worse to come. At 9.59 a.m., the Trade Center's South Tower 
the building that took the second hit began to crumble. It was almost incomprehensible. In a matter of seconds, the skyscraper collapsed and was gone. Suddenly, we hear, you know, I, the security say, everyone get out now, now, everyone run, 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 run for your life. NBC producer Shahar Baran was there with a home video camera. A bunch of women just standing there, shocked. By then, the whole building sort of implodes. It just go goes like this. And you see like a side of the building, and then it goes. And there's this ball, this of silver yellow ball sort of heading towards you, kind of in slow motion. Y you can't figure out what to do. People are starting to run like crazy. If you take a look behind then at 10 a.m., news of another passenger plane in trouble. Someone on United Airlines Flight 93, traveling from Newark, New Jersey to San Francisco, called 911 and reported a hijacking. Then an explosion and silence. The plane crashed here, some 80 miles outside of Pittsburgh. There were 45 people on board. So far, three passenger jets used kamikaze style, and a fourth that might have been. 266 people on board killed. The death toll on the ground still unclear. Then, at 10.30, another sickening sight. The tower still standing, following its twin, collapsing, vanishing in a cloud of smoke. By 11 o'clock, the sense of alarm had spread across the country. Troops standing guard as national landmarks were shut down. Fighter jets actually patrolling the skies as the last airborne passenger planes rushed to safety. 11-14, officials trying to manage the disaster, struggling to describe it all. Um, first of all, Chief, do we have any idea of how many people are in there? We have no idea. Now, as you know, it was pretty much rush hour time that this took place this morning, so the numbers we don't know yet. We how tried to get almost everybody out that we could uh, early on. 10,000 people in each tower would typically be in there on a normal business day. And we get about another 5,000 visitors during the course of the entire day. Mm -hmm. So by 8.30, 9 o'clock, the building should have been full. And New Yorkers were struggling, too. And now they both collapse. There's no more World Trade Center. At 11.42, another plane from Boston declared an emergency. Fearing a bomb on board, it landed in Cleveland. Soon, all planes in Canada, as well as the U.S., were grounded. The borders with Mexico and Canada were sealed, and Major League Baseball announced the cancellation of all games scheduled for today. At 1.12, President Bush, at Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, again spoke to the nation. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward, Earth. and freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. Moments after his speech, the president reboarded Air Force One for a then undisclosed location. Meanwhile, in New York, an army of rescue workers and volunteers from the city's building trades and other unions made their way to the wreckage of Lower Manhattan, seeking the injured and dead. You guys going back? Yeah. Tough job. You worried about that other tower? Personally, I am. I got fellow officers that might be trapped. Trying to be a hero, but I think if you were in this position, you'd do the same thing. Those civilians who could made their way by foot across the Brooklyn Bridge, as New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani called for calm in a city that was more shell shocked than terrified. And I'd ask the people of New York City to do everything that they can to cooperate, not to be frightened, to go about their lives as normal. The mayor's news conference gave the first hint of just how high the casualty count could be. There are over a thousand rescue workers, probably about two thousand that are deployed, trying to get into the buildings, trying to find people, trying to search for people. 
the governor and I spoke a couple of hours ago. The governor has deployed the National Guard to relieve them because our, our people are going to need reinforcements pretty, pretty soon. Just before 3 p.m., President Bush landed at Offutt Air Force Base outside of Omaha. From an underground bunker at the Strategic Air Command Base, he convened a National Security Council briefing. As 4 o'clock approached, the president's spokesperson, Karen Hughes, briefed reporters back in Washington. The Secretary of Defense remains at the Pentagon, and the Secretary of State is en route back to Washington. 5.21 p.m., even as people around the country struggled with the enormity of today's events, a third building at the World Trade Center, damaged by this morning's attacks, collapsed. They advise us to leave because we have, oh my God. Look behind us, please pan in this way, please. Be careful of your baby. This is it. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, no. Fortunately, the building with more than 40 floors had been evacuated. But once again, the concrete canyons of lower Manhattan were filled with the sounds of sirens and the sight of people fleeing for their lives. That's Stone Phillips uh, with a riveting account of all that happened today. And what you see behind me is the scene in lower Manhattan tonight, live as the rescue efforts do continue. So does the fire and the smoke. Three buildings now have been collapsed as a result of this terrorist attack today. Let's go to NBC's Pat Dawson, who's been on duty there all day long as we await the President of the United States. Pat, very quickly, bring us up to date on recovery efforts. Uh, the recovery efforts at this point, Tom, still uh, pretty much the bottom line is this is a rather chaotic situation here. New York City Fire Department Lieutenant uh, was just giving us some information a few minutes ago and said that there are still fires burning down there, still some underground fires. Uh, he told us that there was a rather significant fire in that building that uh, Stone was just describing, number seven World Trade Center, that collapsed late in the afternoon. As he said, there are still fires burning there. They are trying at this point to get to those fires and to extinguish them, as well as the task, obviously, of looking for anyone who might possibly have survived. Although at this point, that is a very, very difficult thing to do in the darkness and the smoke and rubble that this uh, fire lieutenant said runs several stories high in there. Um, and uh, just making a point, uh, or coming on about a point that you uh, mentioned before, as the New York City Firefighters Union saying that fully half of the firefighters originally responding to the, uh, the events early this morning were killed. Uh, that would fit with information that we had gotten from one of the chiefs who was in charge of that operation saying that he knew he had lost at least 50 to 60 men and probably far fewer that he was not able to evacuate. Tom? All right, thank you, uh, Pat Dawson, bringing us up to date on the rescue efforts that continue underway as we look at the scenes that have been described uh, all day long by so many people who were there either as a war zone or reminiscent of a nuclear winter. Uh, the President of the United States will address the nation, presumably from the Oval Office tonight, after certainly the most hectic day of his presidency, one of the most uh, difficult days of any modern president. He began in Florida earlier, went to Shreveport, address the nation from there at Barksdale Air Force Base, then to the Strategic Air Command Headquarters in Omaha, Nebraska, to the very secure bunker with all the more, most sophisticated communications equipment in the world at his disposal for a meeting of the National Security Council. And then he felt strongly that he wanted to come back to the nation's capital, to Washington, D.C. It was symbolically and politically important for him to address the nation from there tonight, that symbol of freedom and power, the Oval Office, of the President of the United States in the West Wing of the White House. Uh, we'll be sharing with you after we hear from the President also the appearance tonight on the steps of the Capitol of the House and Senate members who were still in town, Republican and Democratic alike, Democrat alike, the leaders. Uh, there they are. And after their uh, uh, statement by their leaders, they broke into this spontaneous rendition of God Bless America. NBC's Tim Russert is standing by with me as well. Uh, Tim, this is going to be a great test, not just for the president, but for his entire staff and, of course, for the political leadership on both sides on Capitol Hill. Let's go now, Tim. I'm sorry, we'll get to that later. Here now is the president of the United States in the Oval Office. We expect to hear from him momentarily.
Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world, and no one will keep that light from shining. Today, our nation saw evil, the very worst of human nature, and we responded with the best of America, with the daring of our rescue workers, with the caring of, for strangers and neighbors who came to give blood and help in any way they could. Immediately following the first attack, I implemented our government's emergency response plans. Our military is powerful, and it's prepared. Our emergency teams are working in New York City and Washington, D.C. to help with local rescue efforts. Our first priority is to get help to those who have been injured and to take every precaution to protect our citizens at home and around the world from further attacks. The functions of our government continue without interruption. Federal agencies in Washington, which had to be evacuated today, are reopening for essential personnel tonight and will be open for business tomorrow. Our financial institutions remain strong, and the American economy will be open for business as well. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. I appreciate so very much the members of Congress who have joined me in strongly condemning these attacks. And on behalf of the American people, I thank the many world leaders who have called to offer their condolences and assistance. America and our friends and allies join with all those who want peace and security in the world. And we stand together to win the war against terrorism. Tonight, I ask for your prayers for all those who grieve, for the children whose worlds have been shattered, for all whose sense of safety and security has been threatened. And I pray they will be comforted by a power greater than any of us, spoken through the ages in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. This is a day when all Americans from every walk of life unite in our resolve for justice and peace. America has stood down any enemies before, and we will do so this time. None of us will ever forget this day, yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. Thank you. Good night, and God bless America. President George W. Bush, in his second address to the nation, and certainly the most grave speech that he has made in his very young presidency, as he talked tonight about the terrorists attempting to shatter steel in buildings, but not being successful in shattering the steel of resolve in this country, saying the bright light of freedom will continue to burn. He was a sorrowful and sober president, but also one filled with resolve, as he said, we will find the people who are responsible for this and bring them to justice.
Uh, this has been a long and difficult day for the President and is just the beginning because there are many complex decisions that remain ahead of him now. NBC's Tim Russert joins me now uh, from the Washington uh, Bureau, where he is our Washington Bureau Chief and moderator of Meet the Press. Tim, uh, the President tomorrow will uh, obviously be uh, sending out a lot of directives to his military, to his law enforcement officers, and also to uh, the people who are responsible for this nation's security at airports and in other places. Tom, the President cast this tonight as a battle between good and evil, using the word evil several times. Law enforcement officials and intelligence officials hope that with the cockpit recorders, airport records, and perhaps even some celebrations or proclamations by those who did this, they can quickly determine just who must be retaliated against. The President also said something very important, Tom. Whoever harbors these terrorists will be dealt with in the same way as those who committed the terrorism. That is a very important signal and message to people all across the world. Tom, there's a steely resolve in Washington, a passionate determination to bring these people to justice, but there's also a sober realization that our way of life will change forever. All right, NBC's Tim Russert, who's our Washington Bureau Chief. Tim, we're going to ask you to stand by there tonight. I want to go to Richard Holbrook now, who has been uh, one of our uh, most skilled negotiators and veteran diplomats. He was obviously deeply involved in the Dayton Peace Here on the 40th floor, due in at 9 a.m. She was always early, she said. Always. A sign on a paramedic's van spoke volumes. We know we have uh, some of the major brass uh, of our uh, department missing. We're trying to find them, too. New York Port Authority Police Chief William Hall choked back tears. For him, this was no longer just work. On a personal level, because I know that these are all your men, and it's, it's a business, but I'm sure that a lot of these guys are your friends. How are you holding up? It's business now. It's personal now. Sir? It's personal now. We have to get them. Back live, we have had little relief here. Take a look at this. Hours ago, World Trade Center building number seven collapsed, a 42-story building that crumbled hours after the initial devastation. It was the one calamity here that was not a surprise. Police had evacuated the area early, fearful building number seven would indeed fall down. Minutes after the second tower collapsed, we met a firefighter named Tim McGee, a New York City firefighter. He was covered in soot from the top of his helmet to the bottom of his feet. He was crying. He told me that he had lost all of his men when the building collapsed. He asked us to reach his wife, Maria, tell her that he was okay, that he had survived. Quote, tell her, I love you. Dan. Byron Pitts in Lower Manhattan. Mind you that the World Trade Center uh, complex has seven buildings. So the Twin Towers went down, they're the big ones, but then the 47-story uh, World Trade Center building number seven uh, collapsed. That was in near the end of Byron Pitts' report. Now, building five in the World Trade Center complex was for many hours today described as uh, on the brink of collapse. The state of that building at this hour uh, is uncertain. It was long ago evacuated completely. Now about today's other terrorist strike. So it appears that the, the fires here in the Pentagon are not only stubborn, uh, but spreading. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, television crews were permitted uh, in the area just a, a, a short time ago, uh, and, and they recorded a very grisly scene, Tom. Uh, uh, what they first saw uh, were uh, some of the dead that had been removed from the rubble, uh, covered in sheets. Uh, there's a temporary morgue actually set up in the center courtyard of the uh, Pentagon here. Uh, the exact casualty toll still not known, uh, but scores are, are believed to be dead uh, and still buried uh, underneath the rubble. And there was also some shots of, of the damage, uh, uh, exterior damage around the building itself. Uh, as, as you can see from the pictures, uh, it's, it's eerily reminiscent, Tom, of the, of the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City. The wide gash in the building and, and the, the slanted floors that had, uh, that had just collapsed uh, under, the, uh, under their own pressure. And uh, uh, it, it appears that uh, these rescue workers are a long way from not only containing the blaze, 
but recovering the victims, Tom. I, I find that stunning, uh, uh, Jim Kloszewski, that uh, they've had all day to work on that blaze and tells you uh, about uh, the uh, very grievous nature of this attack on that building, that they still have flames at this hour burning through the military headquarters of the United States. Well, actually, Tom, uh, you know, some consider, consider the location where this plane went in rather fortunate because uh, uh, exactly where the plane went in was an area that had recently been uh, re redeveloped uh, and uh, redesigned with, uh, with very heavy uh, blast walls and fire walls uh, in that new area there. Of course, can't withstand the kind of impact of a 757. Uh, so as, as you look at the building, the fire did not spread very much to the right, the new portion of the building, and the old portion where the fire continues to spread, much of that had already been vacated, those offices vacated uh, in preparations of the remodeling effort uh, that was to, be, that was to uh, be undertaken in that section of the building. Uh, even though the death toll here is likely to still rise significantly, uh, the number of dead is probably considerably less than it would have been if this part of the Pentagon had been up to full staff. Tom? Uh, and Jim, a lot of people are going to be looking at all that destruction and wonder whether our military capability is in any way compromised by the damage to the building here. This is organizational skills. There are very few people in the Arab and the Islamic world who want to become suicide bombers. He has the managerial skills to gather them all together, to train them, to screen them, and to deploy them. He, he's a very rare individual like that. If we destroy Osama bin Laden, there may be another one about, out there. But until Osama number two shows the power of these images. Oh my God. It's difficult to put into words what today's attacks have done to the nation. Calamities almost unparalleled in the country's history. Pearl Harbor is one of the first things that comes to mind. Evan Kornog is a historian and journalist at Columbia University. As the attack unfolded live before our eyes, it was hard not to be reminded of the most recent large-scale sneak attack almost 60 years ago. A date which will live in infamy. After Pearl Harbor, there was the Japanese fleet to go after. One knew where to find the enemy. Uh, here, it's a much more complicated issue. Just as the U.S. Navy was a symbol of our power then, the Pentagon and the World Trade Center were symbols of our power now, our place in the world. Those towers are saying, look at us, we're important. And somebody has come along and said, you're not as important as you think. We are certainly not as invulnerable as we may have thought. For years, authorities have practiced for terrorist attacks, many times under the direction of Jerome Howard, a former emergency management official in New York. You have to plan for the worst. Uh, that's just uh, particularly in a city like in New York or Washington, D.C. The real failure is never like a drill. The enormity of the situation today is just, uh, uh, is, is just incredible. The symbolism of the attack was impossible to ignore overseas. The feeling is uh, that throughout the world, the Americans are not as powerful as they were thought to be. Therefore, these terrorists were really going to achieve a symbolic victory. But officials here in New York and in Washington know the difference between a symbolic victory and a real victory. When the World Trade Center was brought to the ground, the country was brought to its knees, but terrorism experts say just for a while. Did the bad guys win today? They got they got that image. They got well. They certainly our attention. struck a blow today. There's no question about it. Um, uh, but uh, the, our, uh, you know, we are a very resilient uh, a nation, and uh, we are a very resilient people. And we're a very different people than we were just before 9 o'clock this morning when this all began. Back, back, back. Richard Schlesinger, CBS News, New York. During this hour, President Bush said that the terror attacks today took, quote, thousands of lives. The search goes on tonight in the rubble of the World Trade Center towers struck this morning by two hijacked commercial jetliners, the worst terror attack ever on U.S. soil. President Bush vowed to find and punish those responsible. CBS News coverage of the attack on America will continue in a moment. had been lost, but he promised the United States would find those responsible.
What is known so far is that a well-organized group of terrorists, as yet unidentified, hijacked four U.S. airliners with a total of 266 people on board. Two of them were flown, suicide bomb fashion, into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, the third slammed into the Pentagon, the fourth crashed in an open field 80 miles south of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Within hours, both of the World Trade Center towers collapsed. And later in the day, a smaller building in the complex fell apart after burning for hours. More than 2,000 people were injured, and Mayor Giuliani said the number killed would be horrendous. The crash at the Pentagon touched off a raging fire and collapsed one side of the building. Dozens of people were hurt, and many more were feared dead. This evening, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld said search crews were still removing bodies, but he said the Pentagon would be open tomorrow. <laughs> Engine 204. Yes. Sir. Can you tell us first of all when you got here? Uh, approximately 12 o'clock. And uh, like you said, there's, there's no words to describe what happened. There's uh, numerous companies that are still in there, and uh, you know. Now, have you heard the reports? Uh, we have heard a report from the New York City Firefighters Union that perhaps as many as half of the original firefighters who responded, perhaps as many as uh, 10 or 11 companies. Uh, perhaps 200 men uh, have been lost. Uh, that's, I mean, we operate inside the building, you know, so it's a, it's a possibility. Nobody, nobody wants to hope. I'm hoping everybody pulls through, you know. God, hopefully God's with us. So, is that is that word making its way through amongst the rescue workers through the afternoon? No, nobody's nobody's going to say anything until they have a, a definite answer. Like I said, everybody everybody hopes that everyone pulls through. Nobody wants to come up with a number yet. We're still hopeful. Tell me what tell me what is going on in there over the last two or three hours. Are you still fighting fires in there? Uh, yes, there's uh, numerous uh, high rises that are still on fire that we're trying to battle, uh, <clears throat> and we can't get close to it because of the uh, rubble piled up as, as much as 100 feet. So uh, it's just a tremendous effort uh, with all the agencies in the city. How many firefighters would you say uh, and other rescue workers that were, are in there working on these fires? Uh, like I said, it's it's hard to say. This is there's probably three quarters of the city here. Mm -hmm. You know, they were pulling people off vacation, whoever wasn't working. So, the uh, the fires still burning in there. Uh, have you heard of any buildings that may still be in in danger? Uh, no, none none at this time. The last one I believe was Seven World Trade over here. And uh, nothing at this time, though. No. Any, uh, you said the rubble. If you give me some idea of the rubble, how how big it is, how much there is. I mean, the thought of a hundred blocks, blocks. It's three, a forty-story building, and both World Trade Centers and all the little buildings that were surrounding. It's just blocks of rubble. There's no there's no way to describe it unless you're actually up there looking at it. They're sending everybody uh, back to get rest because, like I said, this the city's. They're hurting for members, and uh, they're going to need uh, everyone fresh for, you know, for the rest of the city. God forbid something happens anywhere else. So they're returning companies to get rest and wash up at the firehouse, but we have to stay at the firehouse you know, in case anything happens. Firefighter Anthony Pasquarelli, thank you so much. We know it's been a very difficult day for you. Thank you. Firefighter Anthony Pasquarelli, the New York Fire Department. Uh, Liberation Organization leader Yasser Arafat did not join in. We are completely shocked. In Afghanistan, a spokesman for the ruling Taliban, who provides sanctuary for terrorist leader Osama bin Laden, said he could not have been behind the attack. Back home, it was if war had been declared. I'm ordered that the core resources of the federal government go to help. Be on the top of the list for information uh, or evidence to be found in this rubble. Uh, the terrorists are somewhere in the destruction in the rubble in some way, shape, or form. And any other information or documentation, while it is a big mess and uh, it, it seems insurmountable, uh, there were some very small and significant pieces found in the basement of the World Trade Center bombing that uh, were carefully extracted from the debris. Uh, this is a bigger pile. This has a lot more resources. But right now, the emphasis on saving lives is going to be the number one priority. Evidence gathering, while it is important, is going to be second 
to saving any lives that can be saved. While the information is sketchy, what we're learning is that it was apparent uh, teens that were working aboard these airplanes, in one case, uh, murdering flight attendants as a, as a way to get in the cockpit. That's a lot of people involved in just the four airplanes. How big, how deep do you think this all goes? Well, I, I have heard also, as you point out, uh, possibly two, three, four, or five individuals per aircraft. Uh, you can wreak a lot of havoc with the minimal weaponry on any airplane. Uh, it looks like they had a planned strategy that they executed uh, reasonably flawlessly. I don't think they succeeded uh, in the case of the aircraft that went down in Pennsylvania, but three out of four is a pretty good record, and uh, it does indicate teams that had trained and uh, had a plan that they pretty much stuck to. Joe, uh, w as they dig through that wreckage there, and we can take a look at that live uh, picture of the, of the New York skyline, as they continue to dig through that wreckage, uh, what sort of things, w you, you mentioned in the, in the original bombing there was the, the, the piece of the vehicle, what sort of things, though, might point in the direction other than the, the flight report? Uh, well, um, identifying the victims, uh, there will be some of that I would expect, however, uh, based on the way that the aircraft both entered the towers, uh, we had pretty much an incinerator going on. I don't expect uh, that there's going to be too much in, uh, in actual human remain evidence. Uh, there may be. Uh, the flight data and cockpit voice recorders are probably going to be about uh, the top of the list. And uh, other than that, I don't expect that they would really be uh, getting too much of a useful value. Joe, I don't know if uh, aviation security is your ballywick, but uh, based on what has happened, uh, what into the water and covering all those people, that well. was where we were at. So, yeah. uh, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Newman. I really appreciate you taking the time. As I said, you probably look and feel better in some respects today than you did yesterday. Now, we're going to check in with the president. We're going to check in with the president in just a minute. And uh, at least briefly, I, I suspect it will not be the, the last time today. But just to, as we're waiting for the president, you know, we look at this crime scene in New York City. Um, this is the cabinet room. The president's been having a cabinet meeting. The Secretary of State was left. Here he is now. And we've received the latest uh, intelligence updates. The deliberate and deadly attacks which were carried out yesterday against our country were more than acts of terror. They were acts of war. This will require our country to unite in steadfast determination and resolve. Freedom and democracy are under attack. The American people need to know we're facing a different enemy than we have ever faced. This enemy hides in shadows and has no regard for human life. This is an enemy who preys on innocent and unsuspecting people and then runs for cover. But it won't be able to run for cover forever. This is an enemy that tries to hide, but it won't be able to hide forever. This is an enemy that thinks its harbors are safe, but they won't be safe forever. This enemy attacked not just our people, but all freedom-loving people everywhere in the world. The United States of America will use all our resources to conquer this enemy. We will rally the world. We will be patient, we will be focused, and we will be steadfast in our determination. This battle will take time and resolve, but make no mistake about it, we will win. The federal government and all our agencies are conducting business, but it is not business as usual. We are operating on heightened security alert. America is going forward, and as we do so, we must remain keenly aware of the threats to our country. Those in authority should take appropriate precautions to protect our citizens. But we will not allow this enemy to win the war by changing our way of life or restricting our freedoms. This morning, I am sending to Congress a request for emergency funding authority so that we are prepared to spend whatever it takes to 
to rescue victims, to help the citizens of New York City and Washington, D.C. respond to this tragedy, and to protect our national security. I want to thank the members of Congress for their unity and support. America is united. The freedom-loving nations of the world stand by our side. This will be a monumental struggle of good versus evil, but good will prevail. Thank you very much. Thank you all. The President certainly does not want to answer questions at the moment, nor want to be committed to anything beyond his uh, prepared remarks. And there you see the Secretary of Defense is there. This is this uh, small, there's uh, the Attorney General uh, right beside uh, the Secretary of Defense. A very trying day, unquestionably, for the Cabinet, listening to the President, and I think in time, trying to figure out what, uh, what he actually means in legal and political and military terms, uh, that this uh, was more than an act of terror yesterday, which of course it was, but now becomes an act of war today. And I'm almost certain that Mr. Powell did not make this statement without uh, understanding, agreeing, or appreciating the fact that this was going to be the tone from the White House. No one really thinks the latter is something that can be carried out, but you can make the government of Afghanistan pay a price. The second part of this, however, and this is what policymakers get paid to think about, and this is very, very dicey. Osama bin Laden is relatively popular in certain neighborhoods in the Middle East this morning. There has been a series of unrest in Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and right now it's a very delicate time and a very delicate matter. If, in fact, we assert ourselves militarily, will that cause upheavals in those states which have been relatively pro-West, if you will. Or those situations that were quite rocky, and this could make even rockier. We showed videotape, as you know, of the Palestinians having a party basically following these attacks. Katie, over the last several weeks, there has been suggestions of near uprisings in Jordan. The head of the intelligence unit in Saudi Arabia quit without any explanation. Egypt has always teetered and has been our most loyal supporter and ally in the Arab world. Uh, and we have to be very, very conscious of this. Every cool shot the president makes, if you will, is going to be a two or three bank shot with all sorts of unintended consequences that have to be tr tried to be thought out before you do something quickly and arbitrarily. The situation, Tim, is so complex oh. every way you look. And I, I, I'm, over, I'm stating the obvious, but the challenges that George W. Bush is facing right now are staggering. Absolutely. If you look at just what he has said last night and repeated again this morning, he has laid out and drawn a line for our government vis-a-vis -vis terrorism. He now has to execute. And that is extremely difficult and, as you say, extremely complicated. Because unlike Pearl Harbor, we knew who the Japanese were. We knew who Saddam Hussein was when he went into Kuwait. We knew who Adolf Hitler was. This is something is a little bit more, as he said, a dark enemy and difficult to get our hands around. And if we're going to go after countries that, quote, harbor terrorism, it is going to be an enormous undertaking and one that is going to have extremely significant and dangerous strategic implications. And Tim, you need support for actions like that. And at the moment, Congress is united behind him. The American people, after seeing the images that we've shown over the last day, are certainly united. But as we all know in Washington, support can be fleeting. And if he makes a decision and his advisors come up with a plan that gets U.S. troops involved and American soldiers start dying, or, as Katie talked about before, retaliation occurs, how long does he have that support of the American people and of Congress? And how long does he have the support of our allies? Matt, remember after the Persian Gulf War, uh, after we had Saddam removed from Kuwait, everyone said, never again, we will stand up, we will drive him out, he'll eventually have to leave. What's happened now? We're practically alone in trying to enforce sanctions against Saddam Hussein. Yes, but Tim, at the same time, I mean, we have seen almost worldwide condemnation of this attack, and people from all corners of the world seem to be rallying behind the United States versus the coalition that had to be carefully crafted by, by George W. Bush's father, President Bush, before the, during the months leading up to the Gulf War. 
But Katie, if should be considered an attack on all members of NATO. Let us bring you up to date now on the rescue efforts. Overnight, at least six or seven survivors were found in the rubble of the World Trade Center. As of 7.05 a.m. Eastern Time, 41 people were confirmed dead. But uh, as we have been uh, saying all morning long, the death toll is expected to climb into the thousands. Out of Chicago, United Airlines, which had two flights hijacked yesterday, does not have any departures scheduled until 3 p.m. Central Time. We should also mention no international flights are on the schedule. Two United planes actually left Chicago's O'Hare Airport this morning. You're looking at one of them. Those planes, uh, the crews will be assisting the families of the victims. And if all of this is not enough, NBC News has just learned that the United Nations building in New York has been threatened this morning. Several hundred workers had been sent to the basement as that threat is being evaluated. We should also mention with uh, all of this news about United that the nation's airports are on track as scheduled to reopen at noon Eastern time today. Uh, of course, uh, you know, air travelers should not be expecting a normal procedure. We're also just getting word that the FBI will be holding a news conference in Boston momentarily. That was scheduled for 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You may recall or you may not have heard that the Boston Herald was reporting that five men were identified as suspects. Uh, you'll recall that two planes were hijacked out of Boston. Again, five men identified as suspects. Authorities also found a car with Arab language flight training materials. And in fact, one of the five men uh, was reportedly a trained pilot. Uh, of course, these details are just coming in through published reports, uh, broadcast reports as well. Uh, we will wait for that FBI news conference in Boston. And uh, Bob and uh, Consuelo will get you more on that uh, as that information comes in. Thanks, Selena. I know you'll keep us posted. All right, we're going to go to Maria Bartiromo, who has been making a lot of phone calls to find out what the impact of this terrorist attack has been on invest investors and investment pros. And she joins us from our New York bureau. Maria. Thanks very much, Consuelo. I just hung up with the head trader at one of the large uh, investment banks in San Francisco. He made a very good point to me, saying that this is comes at a very bad time for business because we only have two weeks left in the quarter. Now, you may know that many software companies, particularly within the technology field, many companies really de derive a lion's share of their revenue in the last month of the quarter, September being very important. So there's no question that many companies out there probably will push orders back and say, you know what, we don't need that extra technology right now. We don't need that extra software right now. So this probably will have a big impact on earnings for this quarter, a big impact on business overall. I spoke with the CEO of a large uh, telecom company, phone company. He does not want me to uh, uh, reveal which company. That's fine. But he said he's seeing huge volumes in phone business, people trying to figure out uh, where family and friends are, people trying to figure out who's traveling. One thing, though, that his company has done pretty severely is stop all marketing efforts, stop all efforts to basically get business up. In other words, there's no calls to clients saying, switch our long distance service, use our long distance service, switch to DSL, let me give you a second line. None of that going on. So that's a big impact on business there. We're probably going to see a real short term impact on business in the telecom field, at least over the near term. I spoke with Donald Trump to talk about real estate. Uh, he said to me, look, obviously, this is a quote, the airline business is dead. He said nobody's going to be traveling for a while. Uh, he, he said that uh, it's too early to tell about the impact on real estate at this point, but obviously 8 million feet was just wiped out. Pacific Daylight Time. And so I guess uh, probably by the time we hung up, when he hung up with us, or the phone went dead, it was about, about three minutes that we had about 12 more minutes to live, I guess. Uh, we hope that Mark was able to take a proactive part in thwarting these hijackers. So we, I have hopes that he was able to. He was in a good position. He was, uh, he was forward in the aircraft, could probably be in full view of everything that was going on, probably w w saw what happened in the cockpit. He is very active, uh, take charge, assertive young man. Uh, uh, we have it from other people, uh, another man on the aircraft who called his wife, who said that they were, uh, he was, he and some other passengers were hoping to, to get at these guys somehow. So uh, this was the only flight of the four 
uh, that did not reach its target, which they believed to be Camp David, and that gives us reason to think that perhaps Mark was able to help save the lives of people on the ground. Yeah, there was another cell phone call made from someone who'd locked himself in a rear bathroom who said that yes, we're going to have yes. to do something because it appears we're going to die either way and we have to try something. I mean, it, it appears that something heroic did take place on that I, flight. I, I certainly, I firmly believe that Mark has been in a clinch in, a, in times past and has come through with flying colors. He's a Cal grad, uh, uh, rugby player, very assertive guy, aggressive uh, uh, and smart. And, and we love him very much. We're going to miss him. I can only, um, uh, you know, I think this might be a weird way to describe this, Ms. Hoagland, but the phone call in some ways has to be thought of as a gift. Oh, we, we were very comforted to be able to get the news from Mark himself. Somehow it, it, it made it much easier to, to take. It, it's awful. It, it's a national time of mourning for all of us, so I'm just one of many, many people. We're, we're so touched by the words of our president, by the words of the Congress people hearing, hearing, <laughs> hearing America being sung on the steps of the Capitol building. It's just profoundly moving for me. I'm, I'm delighted to see this rebirth of patriotism among the American people. We need to be strong and, and work together to overcome this hatred that's taken us over. Well, you are uh, amazingly strong given the circumstances, Ms. Hoagland, and uh, uh, our, our condolences, our sin severe and sincere condolences you. to you and your family. Our whole family appreciates it very much. We're just, I'm delighted to be able to express to the world how much we love Mark Freeman, my son. He sounds like an amazing young man. Ms. Hoagland, thank you. The new estimates coming from the Pentagon officials are that about 100 military and civilian personnel were killed in the attack against the Pentagon. According to officials, about 50 Navy, 50 Army, and seven defense intelligence officials are believed to be dead. Notification of family members has already begun. However, they do warn that an exact number won't be known until the investigation is completed. That could take upwards of a week. Switching back to New York City and the World Trade Center disaster, Jason Holmes is a broker for the Aon Corporation, which employs more than 1,000 workers on the upper floor. Difficult to know. Exactly. Jeff Dyke, senior analyst Jeff Greenfield with us now. Back to Atlanta, Bill Hemmer. Aaron, thank you. Listening to Norman Etta, the Secretary of Transportation, he has said up to this point, and I want to paraphrase his words, the airports in America have been reopened on a limited basis. The effort is to get passengers to continue their flights in order to get them to their original destination. There is strict security measures that will be implemented, and for the airlines involved, there's going to be a severe effort involved here to try and reposition the aircraft. Uh, of the other 18 members of the alliance, and it was with that vision in mind in 1949 uh, that those who signed the Washington Treaty enshrined the principle of an attack on one is an attack on all. It's interesting that it has taken almost 52 years uh, for that to be invoked. The tone of solidarity with America was set earlier in London when shortly before speaking to President Bush, Tony Blair called a press conference to announce that Parliament would be recalled on Friday. I don't think there's any doubt at all that this threat is aimed at the whole of the democratic world. The United States has been singled out, but there is no doubt at all that these terrorists will regard us all as targets. And therefore, it is important for us, whilst this has happened in the United States of America, to remember that very basic fact. This is an attack on the free and democratic world as a whole. And that seemed an instinctive reaction.